church. I strive to be all those things that he says. Oh, man. Say that at my funeral. <laughs> but he is correct. I have been really studying, and, and God laid something on my heart a couple of weeks ago. He, he's been after me. He goes, I want to put you on the schedule. And I kept putting it off and putting it off, like kind of resistant to it. And then finally he came up to me. He goes, is it going to be August 11th or is it going to be August 5th? When is it going to be? You have a choice. I'm like, okay, okay. So he put me on the schedule. And at that point, I, I started asking the Lord. I said, Lord, why am I so resistant to this? Yeah, I have preached overseas, and nobody knows me over there. <laughs> and, um, you know, and he used me, and he used others. But I said, why, why? He goes, I'm going to show you why, and I'm going to help you. And so I woke up one morning really early, and there was a word on my mind called, and it was brokenness. And so that that thought just started, I started meditating on that, like what is that, and kind of looking, you know, at some things that are that related to brokenness. And I'm sure that many of you have heard of kintsugi. It's translated to golden joinery, or joining with gold. Kintsugi is the centuries-old Japanese art of fixing broken pottery. Rather than rejoin the ceramic pieces with a camouflaged adhesive, the kintsugi techniques employs a special tree sap, lacquer dusted and powdered with gold. Once completed, beautiful seams of gold glint in the conspicuous cracks of the ceramic, giving it a one-of-a-kind appearance each repaired piece by piece. This method ce celebrates the artifact's unique, unique history by emphasizing its fractures and breaks instead of hiding or disguising them. In fact, Kintsugi often makes the repaired piece even more beautiful and precious than the original, revitalizing it with a new look and giving it a second life. Most times it's used differently than it was before admired and looked upon as unique and beautiful when it's put back together. No two pieces are ever the same because they never break the same. Each is unique. Broken vessels are never discarded by the master Kintsuki artist. Each piece is looked upon as having potential to be put back together more beautiful than it ever was. He sometimes chooses to leave out certain pieces and fill in the cracks with gold and beauty is so unique in that particular piece. Some vessels take a month, some take a few months, and some even take a year. You cannot rush the process. This form of art made from brokenness grabbed my attention and caused me to reflect on my own brokenness through the years and how God took me and made me what I am today. Let's go to Psalms 51 and 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalm 34 and 18, the Lord is nigh unto them that are a broken heart and saveth such as to be, as be of a contrite spirit. So tonight, if, you, if I title this, it would be Broken Made Beautiful. I would like my husband to pray over me tonight. Lord, right now. God, let her be this vessel, God, called by you to speak your word. Lord, let that word flow freely tonight in every one of us. Let our hearts, God, be healed and strengthened. Use her, O oh God, for your glory, Lord, and let those who are hurting tonight, God, let them, God, be ministered to in a mighty way. Have your way in this service. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I know there's only a not very many of us here, but I believe that God is going to speak to each heart here. Amen. And as I was studying this and studying the word and praying, I'm going to be honest with you. God really wrecked me. You see, he chooses to use broken vessels. He puts them back together and he makes them beautiful. We say that all the time, but if we think about it, 
how beautiful it is. Each one of us is unique, as Isabel was saying earlier. How many here can say that God took your brokenness and made something beautiful? I think each one of us can say that here. But guess what? He's not finished. If you have breath in your lungs, he is not finished. The Bible says in Psalm 139.3, he knit us together in our mother's womb. I don't have that scripture up. Can he not put us back together? He put dry bones back together and put flesh on them. Can he not put you back together? Give him the pieces so he can. You see, he doesn't take the pieces. You have to give them to him. He is a gentleman. He doesn't go digging around and taking them by force. You've got to give that to him. When Jesus chose each person or disciple and made them into great men and women who did what they were called to do, he didn't try to hide their flaws. He didn't try to make them perfect in the eyes of the world. He didn't try to fit them in the same mold. He didn't always smooth the rough edges. No, that's not how he worked. Peter was still an opinionated loudmouth who betrayed Jesus, cried bitterly, and repented, and gave the message of salvation on the day of Pentecost. Amen. Paul was still full of zeal and passion for what he believed was right. He endured hardships, imprisonment, and penned over half the New Testament. Mary Magdalene was delivered of seven demons. He, she became a follower of Jesus, witnessed his death, burial, and was the very first one to see him after his resurrection. The woman at the well was so broken that she had five husbands and the man she was with was not her husband. She became the first evangelist to the people of Samaria. We could go on and on and find more and more stories in the Bible. But each one of us here tonight have a story as well. When he put those people back together, the world around them saw Jesus through their flaws. Though their mistake, through their mistakes and their hang-ups, the people saw Jesus through them. When that woman ran through the city of Samaria, they used to know her as the woman with five husbands, but apparently she was effective in ministry because she won the city. That's right. Amen. So Amen. she did not focus on what, had happened to her in all of the abuse and the things that she went through. She met the master. She met the only one who could put her back together. Amen. You see, the world is so good at raising up people, putting them on pedestals, making them famous. You see athletes. You see actresses and actors and, and musicians. And there's movie stars. And they put them up on a pedestal and, 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 and basically worship them. But the moment that their weaknesses and their brokenness and their flaws start to show. They rip them down and they discard them like garbage. That's right. That's right. That is why there's a high suicide rate amongst the people that at one time are up here and thrown away like garbage by the world. That's what the world does. Look at the prodigal son. As long as he had money and riches, he had friends who lifted him up until his brokenness showed literally they then discarded him like garbage threw him in the pig pen and we know how that story ends he remembered there was only one that could restore me and that was my father the father can restore me i am broken i am in pieces i cannot put myself back together but the father can do it amen hallelujah jesus when your child breaks their toys what do they do they bring the pieces to you and say fix it the same goes for us. When we're broken, we must give God the pieces. He desires every piece of us. He chooses what pieces he wants to use, where to put them. And you know what else he does? He chooses to discard the pieces he wants. No, I'm not going to use that. That's not going to be in your life anymore. That friend, no, I'm taking that piece out. That's not for you. I'm setting you apart. I'm creating you and I'm putting you back together into something that I want you to be. You're not going to have this piece. This piece is no good. I he, it's gone. When he takes that piece out of your life, it's gone. See, we try to hide our flaws. But God says, I choose to do what I want with those pieces and cracks and flaws. Just give it to me. You see... 
nobody is too broken. Nobody, not one of us here. And I'm going to start to get transparent, and this is very difficult for me, but I'm just, I said, God, whatever you want me to say, it's just going to have to come. It's going to have to flow. It's, it's not comfortable for me, but it is necessary according to what God feels. And I'll go as far as he wants me to go. See, when you hold on to things that thinking that God cannot use them, you know, I, you know, I, I can't give that up. I can't give that to God. He can't use that. It's just too, too messed up, too broken. When you do that, you're limiting God in your life. Just like when we get a splinter in our finger. When we first get it, we can't even really see it. It's in there. We don't feel it. Nothing happens. You could leave it there. But eventually what happens? It starts to swell. It starts to fester. It starts to come to the surface. It starts to come out on its own. It has to come out. It can't stay there. And so it must be removed. Perhaps it could be unforgiveness towards yourself. We hold on to things that we have done in the past that may have hurt others, that may have caused things in, in their lives to even be affected until this day, even though we're sitting in a pew and we're filled with the Holy Ghost. There are times that we're going to feel unforgiveness towards ourselves. Prison is filled with people like this. You may not be behind bars, but you are still in a prison if you have not given it to God. Don't hold on to those things, to those pieces any longer. They're robbing you of time that could be spent dwelling on the goodness of God. If God reveals them and you keep holding on to them, they are a tool that the enemy will use to keep you from fulfilling your purpose. I'm going to say that again. If you choose to hold on to these things, they're going to be a tool in the enemy's hands to keep you from fulfilling your purpose and letting God make you whole. Only God can make you whole. Give them to God so he continue. He can continue to do the work he started in you. He has started a work in each one of us. And it's not going to be finished until we're in glory. You've got to give him all of you. You see, it's easy to say, oh, I've forgiven that person. I've moved on. Yeah, I've forgiven them. But if those that hurt you are in front of you, can you still say the same? Can you look at them? Can you pray for them? Can you really say I moved on? Are thoughts of them still taking residence in your mind? Are thoughts of the situations and the things that you've gone through, are they still taking up space and time in your mind? You know how else you know that you have not given it to God? You find yourself fearful, worried, angry, easily offended. You may take things said with love and concern for you as an attack and get offended. Then things just continue to get worse. You need to guard yourself and say, God, show me whatever is in me that I need to give to you. I want to give you every piece. Or perhaps, perhaps your testimony is just a venting ground harboring unforgiveness towards people or towards God. Perhaps. Your testimony is just a venting ground, harboring unforgiveness towards people or to God. That can happen. Or maybe the testimony is a piece still buried under self-doubt and lack of trust, and you're just holding on to it. Only God can take that peace, continue his creative work in us, and free us from the weight of it. Only God can do it as a spiritual thing. We have an acquaintance who is now pastoring a home missions church in Michigan in a pretty rough area. And um, he's an awesome guy. Just he's, he's his, uh, his whole family. He's got his wife and his son and his daughter, and they all preach, and they're all in ministry. It's just a powerful family, and they're reaching those in that community that have, that uh, I'm talking brokenness. And, um, he said his he 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 put his testimony out there 
And he said um, that when he was nine years old, he was homeless and living on a park bench in Queens, New York, with his mother and five siblings. They bounced around from park to park, showered in the sprinklers. He carried groceries to cars for tips to buy bread and bologna just to feed the family. He said, during that time, I figured out how to hustle and make money. And that led to a life of drugs and numerous trips to jail. He was in the correctional center over and over. And he said, while he was in jail, he met an apostolic counselor and knew she was different. She was kind to him. And she told him about a Pentecostal church that he should go to. His words, I hurt people, lived on the edge of hell, and left the path of destruction behind me everywhere I went. I have dealt with so much shame over these things. By his grace, God saw fit to redeem my broken life while I was in jail. And then in a small country church in Florida, Jesus was all I wanted. He was the father I had been missing. I can never tell you how thankful I am for the saving grace of God. He truly saved my life. God restored the broken and made it into something beautiful. He had to give, though. He had to give those pieces of himself to God, which were shame, unforgiveness towards himself, so he can today stand behind a pulpit and preach the gospel to people who are just like he was. He is reaching the ones that are where he used to be. And he is pulling them out of the pits of hell. And he is putting them on a pew, serving God and making disciples. As I was reflecting and feeling after God, he was impressing upon some things to me. Things that I haven't thought about. And I really have forgotten things that I'm realizing I have suppressed for over 30 years or more. Things that not God needed to give to me, me to give to him so he could continue the work he started in me. And as I wept, many things came out and I spoke them. I spoke them out loud, giving them to God. Things that were causing insecurities in me to manifest. And that was why I kept rejecting being up here things that i had been holding on to and embracing as my and instead of embracing god as my security i was holding on to my insecurity he's our security yeah we are insecure within ourselves but once we give these things to him his he is our security there's no other way There's no other way to live. So I really had to get involved with the process of giving some buried things to God. And through tears of travail, I kept saying, God, here, here, Lord, here's the betrayal. Here's the broken trust. I'm putting it on the altar, God, because only you are able to take that from me and do something with it because it's just taking up space and time that you need, that you want from me. Here, Lord, here's the heaviness. Here's the betrayal. Here's the rape. Here's things, Lord God, that I've been harboring inside of me and letting them make me insecure and letting them control me. Here, God, here's fear and anxiety, Lord God. Here is insecurity and thinking that I can't do it. I can't take another step. I can't go forward in you, Lord Jesus. Here it is. I put it on the altar, Lord God. Take it from me, Jesus. Take these things, Lord God, that I've been harboring inside of me that no one sees that I have suppressed for so long. Take them from me, Lord God. I can't hold on to them because you need these pieces. You need these, Lord God, to make me into something beautiful. You have started a wonderful, beautiful work in me, Lord God. But you must take these to continue the work, to continue to do what you desire in me, Lord God. God, you don't really need this piece. It's just so insignificant and small. How could you ever use this? I think I'm going to go ahead and keep this, this feeling, this, this thing I've been harboring inside of me of, of rejection and abandonment, Lord God. I think I'm going to go ahead and hold on. You can't do anything with it. It's, it's so small, but you want it. I know you do. 
I give it to you, Lord God, because you choose what you're going to do with those pieces. You choose how you're going to take care of them. You choose how you're going to mold me, how you're going to make me into what you want me to make. But I have to give them to you. I have to put them on the altar. That's the only way, Lord God. You are the one who's doing it. You take the junk. You take it all out of me, Lord God. You stir it up in me. You see, people say Satan attacked me. He gave me these thoughts of these things from my past. Yeah, he can do that. But make sure you discern who's, who's doing that. It's not always Satan. It's God. It's God saying, give that, give that to me. That has to come out. That has to be put on an altar. Because here you build walls around yourself. You're not allowing me to make you and mold you into what I desire. So that you can do what I've called you to do. Hallelujah, Jesus. I laid it all out, and afterwards I felt such a sweet peace. I felt the burdens I had never really known be lifted, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. See, it's more than just saying I've given it to God and I moved on. Oh, I gave that to God. How many times we hear that? But really and truly dig in, inside. Have we really? Have we really? Let's examine ourselves and give God the rights to every piece of our life. Lord, I give you the right to everything inside of me. You show me. You dig it out. The things I don't even realize that I have. Every single hurt, every pain, every betrayal. God, dig it out of me. He wants every part of you. If you're waking up each day and you feel you don't really have purpose outside of coming to church, then get involved in the process of letting God take those pieces that are hindering you and find fulfillment in God. If you're not finding purpose in, when, in each day when you wake up, you have to make sure what's inside of me. Many of you know Court Chavis. Um, he's an evangelist, singer, songwriter, dynamic speaker. Um, he recently talked about how the enemy is constantly throwing seeds of bitterness out, Th seeds of anger, unforgiveness, jealousy, just seeds. He's throwing them out, hoping that somebody will grab hold and, and those seeds will, will produce roots, which then produce fruits. Every seed is going to produce a root and a fruit. And so <clears throat> if, if, if we allow these seeds to produce roots they produce really bad fruits that destroy and so he was telling how he was living for god doing everything right but he kept falling into depression and and all sorts of problems and here's a man who is being used of god and this this is happening to him then one day god revealed to him that he had unforgiveness in his heart he denied it. He said, I was shocked. Like, no, I don't have unforgiveness. What are you talking about? I travel the world. I'm, I'm preaching. I mean, that's crazy. And he argued with God. And he felt, he felt like, what could it be? And then God revealed the person to him. And he's, oh, no. Oh, no, no. Uh-uh. I'm not giving you. No, I'm justified in that. He was horrible to me. I am justified. in. Why would I forgive him? And he said, I argued with God. I had a anger, and I had a right, and I was justified in not forgiving him. He said, he said to God, they hurt me too bad to be forgiven. But God said, they hurt me too. And I came to those who hurt me and forgave them. I came to them and forgave them. And he said he had a young man. He was telling this story. And uh, this young man came and he said, are you telling me? Look, I haven't spoken to my father in 10 years. Are you telling me that I have to go to him and forgive him? He's like, that's what I'm saying. He said, that'll kill me. He said, yeah, it will kill you. It will kill things inside of you. It will kill the hurts. It'll kill the anger. It'll kill the fear and anxiety inside of you because you're going to come up. You're going to come up out of those ashes. 
And so sometimes past hurts arise and we automatically blame them on Satan, like I said earlier. But um, it could be God saying, give them to me. Give them to me. Truly give them to me. But this does take examining yourself. You see, it was a piece buried so deep that Court didn't realize that it was still there. That's where time spent with God and asking him, examine me inside. Lord, I want to go forward in you. I want to go where you want me to go. I want to step into my calling, whatever that is. I want to reach people. I want to bring people out too. So God will reveal it in his perfect time so he could give it to God, so you can give it to God and continue to fulfill your calling. You see, walking in the calling doesn't mean God has every piece or part of you, as we just talked about. It's a process. A curing process. That's what they call it as these pieces are put together. Piece by piece, it has to cure. It can't just be all put together at once. It takes time. It's a process. It's funny how they call it curing because when we go through this process, we are being cured. We're being cured of depression, anxiety, anger, fear, all of these things that attack our minds. In Genesis 41 and 51 and 52, and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God, he said, hath made me forget, deprive, neglect all my toil. And for all my, right here, let's, let's look at this word forget. Forget means deprive and neglect. And all my father's house. And the name of the second call, he called uh, Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So, this word forget does not mean like it's just going to be erased from my memory. It means deprive and neglect. Only God can help you forget. Does that mean he will give you amnesia regarding these things? Probably not. But he will help you deprive your thoughts of dwelling on it, allow you to neglect it, Neglect thinking on it so you don't feed these things your time. So that word forget, Joseph didn't forget all that his brothers did to him, but God allowed him to neglect dwelling on them. God allowed him to deprive his thoughts of, of, of letting those thoughts go to that. It allowed him to step into his calling and do what God said. Okay, he saw the end. He didn't see all the middle. And that's how God's going to work with us. We don't see the middle, but we know the end. All we have to do is look in here and we see the end. What do people do at funerals? They talk about how somebody spent their life. And so I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction here. At funerals, they talk about how someone spent their life. What did they do with their time? How was it spent? How do you know you haven't given God all the pieces of your life? How do you know you aren't still holding on to things even though you feel like you've forgiven and you've given it to God? How do you know you haven't? You know, that's a question I was asking God. Like, how do, how do you know? It is when these things, such as past failures and hurts and scars and wounds and regrets, and they come to mind and you start to, to think on them and analyze them and, and, and uh, what, what could have d- I've done differently and, and feelings of if only, if only I had done this differently in my past, then my children wouldn't be where they are and my, my grandchildren wouldn't be where they are. And if only I hadn't done this and I hadn't been in a bar for 10 years and I had been serving God, if only I hadn't backslidden for 10 years, I, 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 I wouldn't have done all these horrible things. I wouldn't have been, see how it's just a constant flow through our minds. And if that happens, if those thoughts take control of our minds and rob us of our time, then we have not fully given it to God. There are pieces hid within ourselves, possibly without us even realizing it. So how do we know we've given these things to God? It's when those thoughts, those past negative thoughts, when they're triggered, 
we can immediately say and know with surety, oh no, Satan, that's you. I've given that piece of me to God, that piece of my life. God has it now. I won't dwell on it for one second. That piece has already been added to make me what God wants me to be. It's curing. Amen. I'm curing. Amen. As a matter of fact, let's see what the word says about this. Philippians 4, 7, and 8. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful, respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. Amen. That's what you tell the enemy. You know with a surety you have given him every piece. And when Satan tries to come against you, that's what you say to him. The only time that we should go back and reflect on these pieces is when God impresses us to show the world our testimony and give God all the glory. Amen. Amen. You see, the Bible says in John 10.10, 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You see, Satan will constantly try to cause you to dwell on the past and think on them so he can steal and kill what God wants to make you to be. He will kill the promise and he'll destroy it. So he wants to steal, kill, and destroy your time. What is time? Time is your life. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature a new creation, a new created thing. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He needs the pieces to create it. And so I ventured out and I made my own. He can make you whole. He can make you whole. If I had left out this piece, I'd have a hole here. If, if I didn't have this piece, there would be a hole here. But see, God needs every piece, and he's going to make you whole. That's what he does. This is a little bit of a detour. What is the most precious commodity that God gives every single one of us? It's time. Time is a commodity that God has given us that he wants us to give back to him. A commodity, the definition is a useful or valuable thing such as water or time. So if we don't say, thank you, Lord, for this day, the gift of time, I give you every piece of my time today. Create in me whatever you want. Create me to be whatever you want. I desire that today. If you don't, do not give that time back to God, the enemy will take it, he'll steal it, and he'll destroy it. Have you ever heard of the old saying, killing time, a time thief, a time stealer, he destroyed his life. What is life? Life is pieces of time. And when I talked about, I've got a, a little off um, about at a funeral, what do people talk about? How that person spent their life, how they spent their time. What did they do? So what will you do with your pieces? What will you do with your life? Because life is pieces of time. This is a piece. My childhood is a piece. My teenage years, that's a piece of time. That's a piece of my life. I'm an adult. This is a piece of time. I'm a mother. I'm single. I'm married. I'm lost. I'm saved. I'm a grandparent. That is all pieces of time. That is your life. Your life is a gift from God. Time is a gift from God. How will we spend our gift that he wants us to give back to him? You see, God created time to give us so we could choose to give it back to him. We have a choice. What do we do with our life? What do we do with our time? <clears throat> I got distracted. I saw my picture. You see, time and space exist in him. He exists outside of time and space. Our infinite minds have a really hard time trying to comprehend this. In James 4 and 14, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, but what is your life? It is 
even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes. What are you going to do with your life? You're a vessel. You've been given the gift of time. Do you give it back to God? Every piece of your, t- every piece of your life is moments in time. You have to give it to him to let him make you whole and let him make you into the vessel that he wants you to be. If we could just close our eyes and spend a few minutes in prayer reflecting. Let's ask God to reveal anything in us, any piece of us that he wants us to give that we haven't already given to him. I've named some things that he was pulling out of me in the last couple of weeks. You have to sit and you have got to get real with God. You have got to. We are living in a time where you have a choice. How are you going to use your time? How is your life going to be spent? The word spent is time spent. How is that looking for you? How are you going to take this message into your heart and say, God, is there anything in me that I need to give to you? Because I want to make it to heaven. I want to bring my family with me. I want to bring my neighbors with me. I want to be a complete vessel that you use me. You see, he needs to reveal things in you. Each one of us have things. And he needs those things to continue what he is doing. Something else that can cause you to remain with brokenness is self-condemnation regarding your spiritual walk. I know that that sounds kind of crazy, but this is what God spoke to me this afternoon. He just said, brokenness can remain if there is constant self-condemnation regarding your spiritual walk. Constantly saying, I didn't pray enough. I didn't get in the word enough. I didn't reach out enough. That kind of reflection will either cause you to recognize that that was just a piece of time. Take it. Take the time that you have now and reflect on God. Reflect on his word. Pray more. Do what you have to do to get these things out of you. There's two things that you can do. You can do that or it can cause you to um, to go in a different direction. It can cause you to say, well, I didn't pray enough. I didn't read my word, the word enough. I didn't do this enough. Self-condemnation. And it can cause you to pull back. It can cause you to continue down that road. And eventually you isolate yourself and you just move in the opposite direction away from God. Keeping those pieces to yourself. Keeping those pieces of time to yourself and not giving them to God. You'll start, stop getting involved. You'll stop being part of what God is doing. You'll maybe still come to church and sit on a pew. Or, and then maybe you'll just, that's it. That's as far as you'll go. That self-condemnation can cause that. You will never become what God wants you to be if you don't recognize that path and turn around. You will eventually find fault in everyone and everything and slip away. And you will feel justified in doing it. And so tonight, I hope this message touched your heart. And I hope and pray in the name of Jesus. I pray over these people. I pray over anyone listening online, Lord God. I pray that you would go into our hearts, into the deep recesses of our hearts, Lord God, where there may be things that we don't realize, that we haven't seen in a long time, that we've suppressed and we've pushed down and pushed down with activities and goings and and work and, and, and a schedule and things like that, and we just cover it up and cover it up and cover it up. And we've never given you those things. And we don't realize that we haven't really really forgiven or we haven't really repented or or we've been holding on to him thinking you can't use that but you're the master kintsuki artist you're the one who chooses what to do with these pieces but you desire to have every piece i pray lord god that there would be a change in our hearts and our minds in these last days and that we would surrender everything to you that we would truly seek with within ourselves and allow you jesus to dig it out of us 
to give it to you, Lord God, so that you can make us what you want us to be, so that we can go forth in the calling in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Can we pray right now? Can we really do a deep dive into our hearts and, our, and, and, and let God reveal some things? He'll speak to you. He'll reveal it so that you can come forth and give it to him in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen.